talking about what can experimental petrology tell us about Martian rocks. And so the question is, what is experimental petrology and what are Martian rocks? Since I'm in a physics department, I'm sure most of you have no idea what those funny words mean. Um, petrology is the study of how rocks formed. So we are going to experimentally study how Martian rocks formed. And the Martian rocks that we have to work with, we have a suite of meteorites called the SNC meteorites that are proposed to be from Mars. We also have some surface composition, and I'll get into this in a few minutes, but just as an overview. So what we're, this talk is about is how can experiments tell us about how these rocks formed, how the Martian mantle works, what differs between Mars, Martian rocks, Martian mantle, and uh, the Earth, since the Earth is what we know the most about. So why even do experiments? We have these rocks. It's fun. We can look at them play with them. Um, well, to do the experiments, we can learn whether this, this rock that we have represents a liquid composition. Did it erupt on the surface of Mars? Or did it pick up other, ro uh, other minerals, other rocks, some soil along the way? Did it change its composition? The second thing is, is it directly from the mantle? We have uh, tholeites on Earth that erupted directly from the mantle. Did the Martian rocks erupt from the mantle? Um, and then the, the last thing we can also do is start to place each of the rocks in context and start uh, telling a story about how Mars evolved through time. For those of us who are a little vague on geologic temperature. Okay, so a cumulate is a rock that picked up minerals or soil or something from the surrounding areas that doesn't belong to it. So if a uh, liquid is sitting, if magma is sitting in a magma chamber and it picked up crystals from the wall, that would then be a cumulate because it had picked up some other minerals. <laughs> yes. So the question is, what information do we have about the Martian rocks and Martian geochemistry? And our three main sources of data are the Martian meteorites, which are called SNC meteorites, for shergatites, knocklites, and chassignites, the three different classes. Um, we also have surface rock chemistry, and that we've gotten from rover analysis. And we also have bulk surface analysis from different uh, of the orbiters. And I'm going to go into a little more detail about each of these suites of data. Um, the Martian meteorites, the shergatites, knocklites, and chassignites, um, were named after the original... Um, rock from each of those suites, the Shergadites being the first was Shergadi, the Knocklites, and the Shasignites. Um, the Shergadites, with a picture here, are iron-rich basaltic igneous rocks, and they're primarily clinopyroxene uh, rich rocks with plagioclase, magnetite, ilmatite, orthopyroxene, and chromite. But the main important thing is that they're mainly clinopyroxene uh, rocks. Um, they also have magmatic melt inclusions, which are melt that got trapped in the olivine or the pyroxene when it was forming. And that can also tell us about how these rocks formed. Um, and then there's a subclass, which you'll hear more about next week, called the olivine ferric shergatites. And so I'm not going to get too much into those. The next suite of rocks are the knocklites. And these are clinopyroxene rocks rich rocks as well, but these are actually cumulants. These are almost purely clino, uh, perox, clino, I can't say that word today, clinoperoxine, um, and did not erupt on the surface, but have been processed and have come to the surface in other ways. Um, and again, we have melt inclusions within these, and I'll show a picture in the next slide, that can also tell us about how these rocks evolved and how they crystallized. So the last suite of, uh, of the rocks that we have hand samples of are the Shasignites. And these are cumulate dunitic igneous rocks. They are almost purely olivine. Um, again, they also have melt inclusions, and you can actually see one here. Um, and so this is the outline of an olivine grain. And then in here you can see a melt inclusion. And you can see here we have nice glass patches. And here we have lots of different crystals. And those crystals can be uh, amphiboles, biotites, pyroxenes, apatites, uh, magnetites, chromite, feldspar, and then the granitic glass composition. So based on these melt inclusions, we can then tell about how this rock crystallized, how it formed, what depth it came from, um, and things like that. We also have a suite of lander missions. Um, the three successful landers were the two Viking 
ma uh, missions in 1976. The Pathfinder uh, mission, which was a lander as well as a rover, and the rover was called Sojourner. And then the two Mars exploration rovers, which landed in 2003, Opportunity and Spirit, and they're both continually uh, still working on the surface of Mars. And here we have pictures of the three different uh, rovers and then you can see in the middle because we had a lander and a rover the lander actually took the picture of Pathfinder's Sojourner rover uh, analyzing that rock which I'm pretty sure is called Barnacle Bill they like to come up with strange names for things so we remember their names so this is a map of the Martian surface uh, it's a topography map so blue is lower and the whites and the reds are higher um, and I've circled in red all of the landing sites for the uh, landers. Here's Viking 1, Viking 2, Pathfinder. Um, Meridiani Planum is where Opportunity landed in 03, and Gusev Crater is where um, Spirit landed uh, again in 03. And you can see, for comparison, I've circled in block where the big volcanic centers are. And you can see we haven't landed anywhere near them. And you'd say, well, why is that? Those would be the most interesting places. And the issue is that the topography is not flat. So from an engineering standpoint, we can't land on a volcano. So we have to land someplace else and look for what rocks we can see and tell something about the history of Mars. Um, so the Viking landers, the scientific objective was to see if there was life. I mean, that is NASA's goal with everything is, is there life in uh, the solar system besides Earth? Um, and then on a second objective, it was to classify the chemical composition, the atmosphere, and things like that. Uh, the Viking landers did not provide any clear evidence that there was life. There still is debate over this, but uh, for the most part, it's pretty much agreed upon that it did not show that there was life. The thing it did help to uh, resolve was that it provided the only measured link between the Martian meteorites and Mars, the Martian surface. It measured the atmosphere on Mars. And in those little melt inclusions, there are some gases that have been trapped. And they're in the same proportions as the Martian atmosphere. And so that is the direct link between these hand samples we have and the Martian surface. Um, Pathfinder Sojourner River, the, this had a little bit more broad goals because we had both the lander and the rover. And this was to get the petrology of the, of the rocks, look at geochemistry. Again, we were looking at atmospheres um, as well as some other things. And it actually got a huge amount of data uh, from the surface, and it was a great starting place to figure out where to go with the next rovers. And the Mars Exploration Rovers, both of these have been highly successful. I mean, they're still running four years after they landed on the surface for a mission that was supposed to last six months. Um, and their main science objective was, again, look for water, because water is where life is going to be. Um, Opportunity first looked at Eagle and Endurance and found uh, evaporite sequences that were formed at the base of a lake. So when a lake, a lake evaporates, it leaves behind a very distinct layer of minerals. Um, and we've seen that. Uh, Opportunity has seen that. And then it has gone on to Endurance and Victoria Crater to look for the same thing. Uh, when Spirit woke up, to my happiness and most other people's not happiness, we found lots of basalts, lots of igneous rocks that erupted on the surface, and they all had very similar compositions. Um, and that's what I'm going to be talking about for the, uh, towards the end of this talk in my work. Um, and then it moved on to Columbia Hills, where it found um, explosive volcanism. It has also seen evidence for subsurface water um, and some soils that were extremely salty, again, looking at that evaporite sequence and looking at what minerals would form there. So, sorry for the extremely confusing diagram, but I'll try to walk you through it the best. This is the rock data we have uh, of igneous rocks on the surface of Mars. And this is a plot of sodium plus potassium versus silica. And this is a geochemist tool to distinguish one rock from another. Plotted here is all of the data we had in 2006. Um, and this is where the Martian meteorites plot, all down here. The Pathfinder the rocks that it analyzed are plotted up in here. And you can see how these are very different than the, the meteorites. So we know something, has, something is going on on the surface. 
whether these all come from one place and these are a very different place or um, more, we need to know, but we only have, at that point, only had two data sets. Then we got surface rocks from, these are the MER analysis, and you can see here are the picro basalts and a few other basalts that have been analyzed. And this is, those are the rocks I'm going to be focusing on um, for the end of this talk again. This is a rock called Humphrey, which has become one of my favorite rocks. And this is a picture of it. And here you can see we drilled into it to try to get any weathering products or any dust or anything that had settled on the surface off to get an actual representation of what this rock's composition is. And so here it is. And this is a blow up of that area. And you can see that we did a great job of getting rid of most of it, but you're not going to be able to get rid of all of it unless we have the samples. So there's still some holes and still some white stuff that clearly is a later product. Um, but the chemistry is plotted here in this black dot. So. Question, is a picro basalt a subtype of basalt or is it a separate category? Of that? It is a, a subtype of basalt. Uh, it means a very um, uh, primitive basalt, something that could have come from a mantle. So things that are a very primitive plot down here, and as they evolve and fractionate and change their chemical composition, you evolve in this direction towards higher silica content. Um, and then the instrument that I took, well, there's, there's actually been different, not all of these were taken with the same instrument, and that is also an issue with this, is we have instrument bias. The SNC meteorites we have hand samples of, so we can stick them through a typical mass spec or a uh, microprobe and get the data. Um, the data for the um, MER rovers were taken with an APXS, so an alpha proton X-ray spectrometer. So okay, is that not all? Path I can't remember what was used on Pathfinder. I think, I think it was an they, earlier version. I think it was an earlier, maybe not quite as sophisticated. No, it was definitely not as sophisticated. But yeah. yes, it was an earlier version of the APXS was also, also on Pathfinder. Uh, and then plotted in here are some surface composition taken from orbiter data, just so we can compare. So we have a, a large amount of data that kind of looks all over the place, and it's something that does need to be resolved. Um, and figured out how all of these rocks start fitting together. So for orbiter missions, we have a few more successful ones. We had Mariner and... Of course. Maybe. That doesn't work. No. Oh, there we go. There we go. Yes. The orbiter data is circled in black. The red data... He, the red data is the surface rocks from the spirit analysis, and these, this is one example of it. The meteorites are circled down here. They're the small circles. And then this is path. The black circle is, the black circle is from one of the surface rocks. Sorry. I'm sorry. This, data. this black circle, black circle. Is, is orbital data. Okay, so that's aggregate data. Yes. They so take so average, averages of certain areas of the planet and figure out what the chemical composition of, of that area would be. What they do is they take the spectra of each pixel and where the spectra looks similar to another area, they'll bin those to get a chemical composition of that binned area. So it's, it's a very average look at what the surface composition of Mars could be. Well, we have actually have more than one. We have, there are three here. These are um, Adirondack, Humphrey, and Mazatzal. Those were three different rocks um, that were classified as Gusev basalt. And those were the th first three analysis of rocks taken by the Spirit. Uh, more recently, we've taken... Irving, Backstay, uh, Wishstone, Champagne, and now actually there have been some others as well that were taken as well. Um, the, reason I, the reason I circled these three is because that's going to be the focus for the, towards the end of the talk and my, my experimental research. And what's pictured over here is a representative of one of these. Yes. Yes, yes. Yes, but when this is about all of the data we have, you kind of have to throw in point data and aggregate data and hope that something pops out at you. And so, The orbiter missions, and there are pictures of them, um, Mariner 9 in the top right, Viking 1 and 2, which are uh, this one. Um, this is Mars Global Surveyor, uh, Mars o Odyssey Orbiter. This is the ESA mission, uh, Mars Express, uh, and this is the Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter. And those are the dates of when they actually got to the planet and started working. Um, from my perspective, orbiter data is great, but we have to 
kind of lump different parts of the planet together. So it's not as useful to a petrologist or a geochemist. Excuse me. So I'm going to go through a few of the uh, main themes that each of these missions have found. Uh, Mariner photo mapped 100% of the surface, so we had the first images of the entire surface of Mars. Uh, and the really cool thing was that it actually viewed global dust storms that changed as it went through orbit. Uh, and that was the first um, images of looking at global dust storms on a uh, different planet. Um, Viking then went um, and actually got high resolution images of the Martian surface. And again, as, as I said before, it characterized the atmosphere so we could link the Martian meteorites with the surface. Um, and Viking, again, searched for evidence of life but hasn't found any. Uh, Mars Global Earth Surveyor, again, um, observed dust storms that repeat in the same location within a week or two of the time they occurred the previous year. So we could actually do time sequence of looking at the surface of Mars. Um, it also actually found... Um, found gully formation as well as boulder tracks so we could see that the surface wasn't dead. We had things moving, we had gullies forming, we had winds, we had boulders moving and things like that. Um, Mars Odyssey um, actually got maps of minerals and chemicals which I had shown you in the previous diagram Um, and it also identified areas with water or water ice buried on the surface. Um, Then ESA's mission its main objective was to uh, search for subsurface water, and it uh, confirmed Mars Odyssey's results of finding water on the surface. Um, and Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter, its main objective is to look for fine, uh, subsurface water, uh, as well as look for landy, worthy landing sites for future exploration, and that's a mission that's still going on. And the data is, I think, just coming out now. So... These are some of the cool things that we can do with the orbiter data. Uh, We can make um, maps of the surface, and this is from Mars Odyssey. It's a water map. So we have uh, the poles are all the way up here. We have area of water, and we can see that water ranges on the surface from almost zero all the way up to about 8 weight percent water. And for this picture, they actually cut the poles off because they're ice poles, so it's going to be 100% water, relatively 100% water. Um, and then based on spectral data, we can actually do mineral mapping, and Mars Express has looked for hydrated minerals, so minerals with bound water, clays and sulfates, um, and these are plotted here, and wherever there's been uh, uh, analysis, they've circled it either in red or blue or yellow, depending on what different mineral it is. So again, NASA's big push is to find the water on the surface, because that's where life would be. So... Since that's not what I do, I'm an experimentalist. I'm going to bring you back to what I do and why I do experiments and what to do them on. And there's two things. We have the meteorites and we have the surface data points from the rovers. Um, and I'm relatively new to this field and there's been a lot of work done on the, experiment, on, on the meteorites and the surface data is new, so I've gone in the direction of working on the surface data. Um, so I've taken uh, the Humphrey Rock, which I've shown you pictures of, and crystallized it um, so we can see if it represents a basalt that erupted on the surface. We can see if it's a primary mantle melt, if it came directly from the mantle of Mars and erupted, or if it got processed along its way. Um, and then I've actually been able to connect it with, mineralogically with one of the SNC meteorites. So that's what the next part of the talk is going to be of how I do this. And this is just... Uh, to remind you that that's a picture of Humphrey, and this is where it's plotted. Um, so Humphrey, based on the images, we know that it's a fine-grained vesicular rock. Um, so the vesicles were dissolved gases at one point. When it erupted on the surface, those uh, exolved from the, the magma, and so we have little bubbles left. Um, it has less than 25% olivine in it, and I've circled here, which I'm not sure if you can see in red, um, one of the olivine crystals, and that's how we can see. This is a microscopic imager of that rat hole. Um, And based on the composition, it's been suggested to represent a liquid, but without doing experiments, we don't know. And the reason I chose Humphrey is because it's the most primitive of all the rocks, as, and it contains the least amount of alteration products. We know that based on imaging and spectral data. We can see different minerals have different spectra, and so we can tell how much weathering products and what types of minerals are in it. So, 
since the rock's sitting on the surface, though, I can't actually do experiments on that rock. So what I do is I make a synthetic powder of the Humphrey composition using MgO and SiO2 and Al2O3 to get the composition of the rock. Um, and then I fire it at 100 and uh, 1400 degrees in an oven to make sure that it was liquid and molten and so it's completely homogenous and we live in Houston where there's a lot of air, uh, a lot of water, I'm sorry, in the air so I want to make sure that there's as little water as possible. Uh, and this is just a comparison of the, chem the actual chemistry from the APXS data from the rock and these are two different um, calibration tool, tech, uh, two different calibrations of the same APXS data. And so it does show that there is a little bit of room for error in the analysis. And this is the chemistry of the rock, the synthetic rock that I made. And you can see that it's a very close match to the two rocks, on the, the two uh, different uh, analysis, or the same analysis, two different techniques to get the, the data. So we have um, different ways that we can go about playing with this rock to tell what it is. We can stick it in a piston cylinder apparatus which can go to mantle pressures, so 4 kilobars to 16 kilobars deep in the mantle of Mars and, and crisp, uh, melt it and crystallize it there. Or I can stick it at a one bar furnace, so just pretty much stick it on the surface of Earth and start heating it up uh, and that would be more surface eruption conditions. Um, this is just a list of the equipment that we have over at Johnson Space Center where I do my experiments. Uh, we have the one-bar furnace, which is sitting on a tabletop, so it's at normal conditions, and we can heat it uh, and melt it and then recrystallize it. Um, in the middle is a piston cylinder, so we have pressure coming from the top and the bottom, and our, my experiment's in the middle of that and getting squeezed. And then we're running, this is uh, running current through the sample, so it's heating it up that way. And then on the right, which... Um, I'm actually, I don't have any data from, is a multi-anvil, and that can go to even deeper pressure, so we can go all the way down to uh, halfway down in the mantle. Uh, for analytical equipment, we have an electron microprobe, which is shown here. So our sample is in here in vacuum, and we shoot electrons at it, and it can measure chemical analysis. Uh, in the middle is a FTIR, Fourier Transform Infrared Spectroscopy, uh, Spectroscopy, which can measure the dissolved water content in my experiments. And all the way on the other side is a uh, scanning electron microscope, which can, we can use to do mineral maps of my experiments to see what minerals are in them. So the question is, is Humphrey a liquid? Well, if it's a liquid, it will crystallize the exact same uh, crystals that are in the rock at one bar. Since we don't have the rock, all we know is that it has about 25% olivine, and we know the olivine composition based on spectra. So, I, to do that though, we conduct experiments at one bar in the gas mixing furnace, and um, they're at high temperatures. We take them above where they're going to melt, and then recrystallize them to see where crystals grow. And this is the result. This is a plot of the olivines and pyroxenes that crystallize in my experiment. And plotted over here is the Mg content. Over there is uh, iron, and uh, the top axis, which has been cut off, is calcium. And the green star with the error bar is the natural olivine based on spectra. Spectra aren't perfect, uh, especially since we don't know the exact conditions that they were taken under. So there is a, quite a bit of an error bar on that. The red dots, uh, the red circles, are my experiments, and you can see that my experiments fit nicely within the error bar of the natural olivine. I've actually been told um, by the person who who did the analysis that this is actually shifting a little bit based on new uh, temperature data. So my experiments fit even better. So the answer then is yes. Humphrey represents a basalt that erupted onto the surface of Mars, and not something that picked up dust or soil or other um, mineral grains or anything else on its way to the surface. But the question is, did it origin? Yes? There is, um, most times when a basalt erupts on the surface, it actually releases gases instead of absorbing gases. So you might get absorption onto the surface, the very, very surface, um, but again, we ground that out. So the depths that we're going, we're not going to see any atmospheric contamination. So the question is, did this come directly from the mantle, or did it sit in a magma chamber, like at Hawaii, when a basalt comes up, it sits in the magma chamber, cools, and then explodes? Um, so how do we figure that out? 
Well, if it originated deep in the mantle and came directly from the mantle, it will be in equilibrium with the minerals in the mantle around it. And those minerals on Earth would be olivine and orthopyroxene. And most people have assumed that they're the same on Mars based on all of the old chemical data. So we're going to continue with that assumption and assume that we're looking for olivine and orthopyroxene. And this is a little diagram. Depth going down here. We have the mantle. And so if it was melting here, it would be in equilibrium with the olivine and orthopyroxene before it came up. And then it's going to sit in a magma chamber. And the question is, did it change its composition there before erupting, or did it come straight up? And so that's what we are investigating. And the experimental approach for this is to do liquidus and nearless liquidus experiments um, on the Humphrey composition, um, and this time at um, mantle pressures. And to do that, we squeeze them in the uh, quick press uh, piston cylinder at Johnson Space Center. And these are the results uh, from my experiments. So we have pressure plotted here from deeper to shallower. So this is the surface that's deep in the mantle. Sorry, petrologists think that way instead of how most people would think. Um, and then temperature is increasing going on that direction. So out here we have an all-liquid field, so we have a magma. And then to the left of this line we have a liquid still, but it has started crystallizing crystals. And again, we're looking for olivine and orthopyroxene for it to be from the mantle. So at low pressure we have olivine. Well, that's good. But once we get up to mid-pressures, we actually have pigeonite. Pigeonite is not an orthopyroxene. It's actually a clinopyroxene. It has too much calcium. So it's saying that this, this rock, while it is a liquid and it erupted on the surface, it has changed its composition sometime between, erupt sometime between when it was formed in the mantle and erupting. And so, that's just saying what I just said. And so what happened is, it formed here, in equilibrium with olivine and orthopyroxene. It rose, it sat in the magma chamber, and it started crystallizing. And when it erupted, it left those crystals behind. So it didn't come directly from here. It stopped along its way. And there's no way to figure out what it left behind, how much it left behind, or anything. So all we know is that, yes, this represents a, a liquid that erupted, but we don't know anything else about the mantle. Yeah, sorry. I'm so, I'm so, it, so, it, oh, so, yes, so it, 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 was, it was in equilibrium with olivine and orthopyroxene. And then it came up here. That's the assumption. Yes, that is the assumption. Yes, that is, that is the main assumption in this talk. And then it rose up here and sat in a magma chamber some, at some depth. And I have it pretty shallow here, but it could have been deeper. Yes, of course. It's, crystal, it's crystallizing, and most likely it's crystallizing olivine. And olivine is magnesium, iron, and silica. There's no calcium. Well, actually, it, yes. What, what, what happens is you have a sum of 100 weight percent. And so when you lose magnesium and silica and iron because you're crystallizing olivine, your 100 goes lower, and so then you actually gain calcium. Yes. We, we are precipitating out olivine on the way up, and we just don't know how much, and so that's changing our composition. We're evolving. That's what we... Right. Yes. Just curious that you were considered very important, <coughs> given the amount of water we found. I'm wondering if, at least in some parts of the mantle, there might be some part, some water in that composition. Absolutely. My, my composition actually is not anhydrous, even though I tried, which ended up working for the benefit. I mean, it's Houston. We have lots of atmosphere. Uh, we have lots of humidity. There was no way to get rid of all of it. Um, I have about 0.1 weight percent dissolved water in my system, which is very similar to what erupts on the surface of Earth at mid-ocean ridges. And so it wouldn't surprise me that Humphrey had about 0.1 weight percent. So it's actually a good... It actually wasn't bad that they had 0.1 weight percent. It's a, it's a good comparison. So, but yes, most likely there was at least some dissolved water. So, the summary of the experiments, Humphrey does represent a liquid. It erupted as a basalt on the surface, um, and it didn't, wasn't accumulated, didn't add extra crystals in. Um, but it's not a primary melt. It experienced low pressure, and we call it fractionation, when it leaves the, the crystals behind um, before it erupted on the surface. So the second thing I said I was going to talk about is, or the third thing, I think, can we connect 
any of the surface rocks with any of the meteorites. They seem very different chemically. Um, and it would be important because we have these rocks and they could tell us more about uh, Mars mantle. So um, most of these rocks, though, are cumulates. They're not basalts that would have erupted. They have added um, olivines. They've added pyroxenes. Um, so they're not... Um, we can't directly compare the two. So can we figure out what crystallized these rocks? So what happens is when those minerals get left behind, when the basalt erupts, they can form layers. And so you have a layer. If we had olivine crystal... Yeah. So if when we're sitting in the magma chamber, we're crystallizing olivine, right? And we're going to form olivine. And olivine is very dense because it's magnesium and silica and iron. So it's going, to, it's going to drop down and form layers at the bottom of this magma chamber. And when the basalt erupts, it's just going to erupt off the top. And so we're going to leave behind these lenses of olivines and pyroxenes, these very dense iron-magnesium minerals. Now, when an impact comes in, if that's shallow enough, it can get to those. So we have samples. This is purely olivine. It's purely that precipitated olivine. This is purely precipitated clinopyroxene, similar to what I crystallized in my experiments. This is kind of a mix of everything. So can we figure out if Humphrey, the rock that we've been playing with, crystallized any of these rocks? Um, and it can if, when, in my experiments, it crystallizes the same composition as what's seen in these rocks and the same minerals. So we have the experiments and we have the rocks. Do they match? And this is the Shasigny meteorite, which was a pure dunite. It's a pure olivine MGFESI rock. And so the Shasigny Dunite is a cumulate rock, and um, it has a phosphorite content of 68. That means the proportion of magnesium to iron is 68. So it's very magnesium rich. And it's similar to the olivine crystallized in my experiment, which is 71. That's within error of both of the measurements. Um, and so it suggests Humphrey could be a um, parent to this rock. We also had those melt inclusions, and there was some melt left in them. We can start playing with them and adding back in this olivine to see what composition it gets. And if we do that, I went the wrong way. Ignore the rest of this table because it's from a complicated paper. Um, this is the model composition when we do that, when we take that glass composition and keep adding olivine back in. And this is the Humphrey composition. And they're really close to matching within error of both of the calculations. So it does suggest that, yes, this Humphrey rock could have been parental to this, this rock we have in hand sample. And so now we actually have a second match between surface things. We had the atmosphere the first time, and now we have a, surface, a match between one of the rocks on the surface and one of the rocks that we actually have a hand sample of. So uh, just to wrap up what I've probably thrown way too much chemistry at all of you... <laughs> Um, the experiments have proven that Humphrey can represent a basaltic composition, something that erupted. Um, it's not directly from the mantle, but fractionated and changed its composition on the way to the surface. And we do now have a link, geochemical link, between the analysis on the surface of Mars and one of these Martian meteorites that we call SNC meteorites. Thank you. Okay, so do I have a melt inclusion here? Yeah. Okay, so here, what you do is you have melt inclusion here because they're perfectly circular, or not perfectly circular, but they're relatively circular. They have a glass composition, they have different minerals, and you can see that the olivine grew very nicely around it, so it trapped it inside of it. This is, this is a crystal, and it has crystal growth features, and then this is a melt, and usually, some, um, because this thing has been cooling throughout time, it usually has some crystals in it as well. So what you can do is you can actually take this out of the, the rock and remelt it and get its bulk composition. And then you know what the compos composition of this is, so you can keep adding the olivine back in to figure out what composition could have crystallized this whole thing. Uh, <laughs> Yes.
life involved in the water. Yes. Because a lot of the origins of life can Absolutely. And these hash nodes, some origin of crystals and so forth. Um, that's actually the next step of this project is to start adding gases, so chlorine and fluorine and water to the system and seeing if we can start degassing them and see what happens and see if we have any um, of the minerals that could be useful for originating life. So I haven't actually gotten there yet, but that's the next step of this project is to try to figure that out. So what we did was we have a few of the Martian meteorites are liquid basaltic liquid compositions, or close to basaltic liquid compositions. And what we can do is, we know the ratio of the elements in all of them. And they're all the same. And so what they can do is they can start playing games with those ratios and comparing them to terrestrial rocks, and the ratios in terrestrial rocks. And if you play with those two ratios, you can figure out what the composition of the mantle that produced those ro the Martian rocks is based on the terrestrial mantle. And so we know it's similar. There are differences. Mars has more iron than Earth. Mars has less aluminum than Earth. So we know that there are some differences. But once we figure out what that mantle should approximately be, we can also play with it. And what we can do is we can take it... Here we go. We can take it and put it in this machine, which goes to 60 GPA. So much, much deeper. Um, and that's in the middle of the, the middle of the mantle. So we can play with that and see what the, the minerals are. Um, and those suggest that it should be orthopyroxene. So it's not just a, an assumption saying Earth is this way, Mars has to. Um, there's been a few assumptions that suggest that it should be similar. The meteorite? Chassigny? It's named for a town in France. Uh, the meteorites are named after where they found, and I don't remember where Shurgati or, Sh or Nakla was found. Um, Chassigny was found in the 1800s in France, and at that point we just knew it was a meteorite. Um, and then sometime in the 1900s um, it was proposed to be from Mars, and then it wasn't until uh, Viking that we knew it was. And that was 83. Yes, yeah, so you have to have an impactor, so you have to have an asteroid or a meteorite of some sort hit the surface that's large enough to eject these off of the surface of Mars. Yep. Absolutely. Um, probably easier than going backwards. So, there we go. Um, so, the large volcanic provinces we have are Olympus Mons and the Tharsis Plateau, and then we have Elysium Mons out here. And what people have done is taken the spectra from the orbiters and try to figure out where these rocks have come from. Um, and most people think that they're from the Tharsis Plateau, but right now it's still questionable as to where they're from. So what they do is... There, right. So. What they do is they look at the impacts we have that are similar ages to when these things have been ejected, or proposed to be ejected. And then they look at the spectra of those areas, and can they see anything that looks like 90% olivine, like the dunite, or 90% clinopyroxene, like the shergatites, or the noclites. Um, and I think somewhere in Tharsis, they found something that could be the area where uh, Shasigny had been ejected from. But it's... It's kind of speculative. <laughs> it's, not a, it's not a unique solution. <laughs> um, yeah, absolutely. The, that is a question, and there are some that are impact melts. Um, and a lot of the lunar meteorites are impact melts. Um, and even some of the Martian ones are. But if you get a, an impact that comes in sort of straight down, coming sideways, the heat stays behind, but your rock goes that way. And so the rock gets... Um, excavated, whereas the heat remains, and so your rock doesn't. But most of these have seen shock, and um, the minerals are not beautiful crystals. They have um, shock features and sorts. The impacts will melt some things, and they'll vaporize something, but they won't melt everything. A lot of things will just be fragmented. Shock wave behind something is fragmented, you can boost it up. And that's what they're looking for. They're looking for what they're called ray craters, and those are craters where the impactor came in at some obliquity. On a percentage basis, more iron in the yes. Earth's mantle. I have heard it said, I'm not sure if it's correct, I, I need some Earth's core as a fraction of the planet mass is smaller than Earth's core. So Absolutely. Is that the case then that less of Mars iron went into the core and more? Absolutely. Yes, we have more iron in the mantle than the terrestrial mantle, especially we have a much smaller core. Although the size of the core is debated since we don't have any geophysical 
data for Mars. So that's based on geochemical arguments. We have geochemistry and we have the orbital dynamics. We have, and we have orbital dynamics. But the size of the core is... is dynamics will put some constraints as on long the radial as, mass distribution. As long as we know the chemistry of the core. And so if you play with the chemistry of the core, the chemistry of the mantle, and the chemistry of the crust, you can change things drastically. So, but yes, the Mars mantle is more enriched in iron, mostly because, or partially at least, because we have a smaller core. Thank our speaker.